today is uh, an important word for some of us because I really believe that God does bring fresh revelation. And a lot of the time, the word is the same, but we're at a different place. So the understanding that we get can be different because you're in a different situation or scenario. Yea, though, you might have read the word before. And a lot of us, I think, get confused over our, our identity as believers, who we are as a believer, who am I? Am I good? Am I bad? Am I half good? Am I like 50-50? I've got God in me, but I've got sin in me, so I'm kind of, you know, a bit strange. Are we kind of almost schizophrenic Christians? Uh, Jekyll and Hyde. I've got my new nature, but I've also got my old nature, and you know, well, what one is the real me? And often that can lead to lots of other problems in our Christian walk, in uh, our freedom and our liberty. It can leave a lot of people tied up in guilt and confused as to who they are. As Christians, we need to know who am I at the core? Who am I? Yes, I know what the world says about me, I know what the devil says, I know what the wife says, but what do the word of God say I am? Because that is my identity, irrespective of how I feel, and irrespective of whether you accept it or not. You can meet some people and you say, oh, you look lovely today, they can't accept it. So it's like, you go up to someone and say, oh, you look really nice today, and they go, what, me? Yeah, you look really nice. What, me in these old rags? You know, and they put themselves down. People have said to me, I look nice today. Do you know what I say? Yeah. <laughs> well, I just go with it. Yeah, I know I look nice. I've got a good mirror indoors and I look good. But we can, we can get into this place, even as Christians, where our identity is quite confused and mixed. So we're going to look at a little bit of a theology this morning and see if we can bring some clarification to who we are at the core. Who are we? As Christians, it's easy to divide ourselves into different compartments, self-assigning ourselves to various identities according to our actions. Okay? Often according to our actions, we get identity on ourselves. In an attempt to understand our onward go in struggle with sin, there is a temptation to split ourselves in half. And let me just say this, sin is sin. Sin is sin, and we've got to overcome it. And when we sin, which is falling short of God's best, we need to repent. If sin doesn't cause any grief in your heart, you've got to question whether you're a believer. You have to question. If sin does not cause you an issue, then you have to question, well, what do I really believe? Who am I at the core? Have I been born again or have I not? Okay? When uh, we sin, we struggle a lot of the time. But sometimes in our attempt to understand sin, there's a temptation to split ourselves in half. Old man versus new man. Sin nature versus new nature. Yin and yang, dark and light. And in trying to understand this conflict with sin, uh, we, it sounds humble sometimes when we say, I sin because I'm sinful at my core. And that's why I sin, because I'm sinful at my core. However, is this as accurate as we believe when we read scripture? We are born again Christians and we're supposed to not to live a spiritual schizophrenic life of yin and yang over our identity. Now the answer sometimes is simpler than we think. First, the definition of sin most understood is wrongdoing or transgression against God's law. There was no law. God created the earth, the heavens, humanity, and He's the creator. He is the potter and everything is the clay. Therefore, as the potter, he gets to choose what the law is, what the boundaries are. When I was a kid, we used to go and play football up the, up the fields in them days when you could go out from 
first light till dark. You didn't eat. You didn't take bottles of water. You didn't use suntan cream or anything. You just went out and spent the day out, and that was it. No meteorites were going to blow you up. No. My mum never, never worried about me going out, being kidnapped or blown up or anything. That life was different. But whoever owned the ball got to choose the rules at the end of the day. Okay? And God has created the earth on all that is in it, Psalm 24 says. Okay? So, so by definition, God decides what the boundaries are. Why? Because God created it. If you don't like it, get off and find yourself another one. Uh, so we have to understand, sin includes a failure to do what is right a failure to do what is right by God. Sin often offends people. It can be violent. Sin can be lovelessness towards other people. That's sin. Our best efforts are seen as dirty rags. Now, that doesn't mean to say we don't offer anything to God because he doesn't accept it. They're dirty rags. It's just a comparison. You know, in comparison with God, because of his greatness. But it is re- ultimately, sin is rebellion against God's best. That's what sin is. It's rebellion against God's best. Okay? In its simplest form, a lot of definitions or dictionaries say sin is simply missing the mark. But it's a lot more than that. Sin causes separation in our relationship with God. You know? Now, we are saved and born again and sealed by the Spirit, but that doesn't mean to say you're always walking in the Spirit, because you can walk according to the Spirit or according to the flesh. You know? And sometimes I walk according to the Spirit and I do great. Other times I walk according to the flesh. You know? The dog came in the bedroom yesterday and ripped up a bin bag of shredded paper and then decided it was confetti and wanted to run it all over the house, all over the bed, in the bed, in my socks. How did it get in my socks? I don't know. But that's what it does. Let me tell you, at that moment, I was not walking in the spirit. I was walking according to the flesh. And the words were, who bought that wretched dog? And Mara said, you did. Well, yeah, fair enough. All right then. Who? Who? And I tried to think of something else. But sin is a problem that has entered humanity. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was far more cunning than any other of the beasts of the field which the Lord had made. All right, let's just look at that. Now the serpent was more cunning than any of the other beasts of the field that God had made. Now straight away, Adam was given dominion over every beast of the field. He'd already got dominion over Satan, over the beasts of the field. He'd got dominion, he'd got authority. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said you should not eat from every tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst, or some translations say middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it, or you should touch it, lest you die. Well, God never said that they shouldn't touch it. He just said you shouldn't eat of it. Lest you die. In other words, or you will die. Then the serpent which is a beast of the field, which they already had authority over, then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows in the day that you eat, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eye, that it was desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. So also she gave to her husband with her and he ate. 
And both of their eyes were opened and they knew that they were naked. And so they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. So sin coming into humanity came in at this point. Before this point, Adam didn't have a struggle with the flesh or the sinful nature. But sin came in at this point and he'd already got dominion over the beasts of the field. But sin came in and they sowed for themselves fig leaves, but we know God in his grace accepted them and loved them irrespective and he made them proper coverings. And sometimes we try to cover up ourselves with our own humanity instead of being healed in Christ Jesus. So sometimes we struggle with things we've done wrong and we try to make ourselves better, but we still struggle with guilt and different things because we're doing it with our own humanity, not recognising the Father's love and grace. And when he covers your sin, it's covered. Amen? I'll separate the east as far as from the west and I'll remember your sin no more. Now that doesn't mean God can't remember your sin. He can remember your sin, but he refuses to recall it. It's gone. He loves you. And he said, you know what? I love them. That's been dealt with. I'm not going to recall that anymore. Do you know when sometimes you get in an argument with people, you haven't got over things because suddenly you throw out things from the past because you haven't actually forgiven them? You know, and things come up. Well, don't forget you said that. Don't forget you did this. Or don't forget this, that and the other. And we suddenly add to it because we, we hadn't really forgiven them. And when you forgive people, you'll receive healing within yourself. You get healed and that way you won't regurgitate the problem all the time. He surrendered to the temptation exactly as John describes in 1 John 2.16. First, she gave in to the lust of the flesh. Eve saw that the tree was good for food. Then she gave in to the lust of the eye. The fruit was pleasant to the eye. Then she gave in to the pride of life. The tree was desirable to make one wise. So, and they're often the three areas of temptation in life today. What we see, what we think is going to be good for us, and the desire to move on, to gain knowledge. With Adam and Eve, Eve was deceived by the lies of the serpent. Adam willfully took from the tree of, good, of uh, knowledge of good and evil. He willfully took it, not accidental, wasn't deceived in it. He knew exactly what it was and he'd done it, just like you. When you sin, you know exactly what you've done sometimes. We make up all the excuses, because that's what Adam did. Lord, it was this woman you gave me. You know, I'm the same. Lord, it's those useless drivers around me. Lord, I wouldn't have lost my temper if she hadn't have done X, Y and Z. And we, instead of taking responsibility for our actions, we apportion our actions on other people. It's the Prime Minister who really winds me up. I wouldn't swear if he didn't make stupid decisions. You know, and we don't take responsibility for our own actions. They're wretched kids. Blimmin' kids. Driving me up the wall. You know, whatever it is. Yesterday or the day before, the cat bit me. Blimmin' cat bit me. For no reason. Psycho. Cats are psycho. Dogs aren't. They're too thick. Dogs don't do psycho. Cats do, and she lays on my bed and I always rub her and caress her and she loves me more than anyone and I love her and I kiss her on her nose and stroke her. She's she got a big fat belly, really wobbly. She's had, she's had four children, okay? So she's got this big fat belly and I rub her belly for her. She's like, what's that? She just turned around and bit me and didn't just once. She bit me several times. But she cat, the curse. I don't think... And I said, why, why did we get this blimmin' cat? It's evil. It's attacked me. And yet again, I got the cat. You know? But we apportion things. From this point, with Adam and Eve, plague, uh, sin plagued humanity and governed 
humanity in their disobedience to God. You don't have to teach a child to sin. You don't have your children say, Jude, come here. Come here, Jude. Now listen, you've been a good boy for two days. I want you to really play up today and be in rebellion. You know you love it. This is how you do it. Watch Daddy. Well, he probably does, but no. Uh, (laughs) But a child within itself will naturally rebel. Okay? Children rebel. Why? Because we inherit a sin. We inherit sin into our being. Everyone born from Adam has inherited sin. So it is there. And we can't overcome it. We are slaves in the sin market of sin. And that's why Jesus had to be born without sin to set us free from the slave market of sin. Amen? That's why he was he had a supernatural father and a natural mother because the woman does not pass on sin. But it is the male side that passes on sin. And so when God created, uh, when Jesus came to the earth, he had a natural mother who was a sinner. She was a sinner. Okay? She sinned. Why? Because she's born of man. She had a father. So sin was a part of her being. You know? So we've got to try and understand these things. Don't be distracted this morning. Okay? So, from that point, Jesus had to die on the cross because he said, look, humanity is stuck in sin and you can't get out of it. And the only way you can get out of this sin is for me to set you free because I'm the only one who is sinless. I've never sinned. He never sinned. Why? Because he didn't have a natural father. He didn't inherit sin. He had a supernatural father. And so he never sinned. He never thought an unkind thought. He never sinned in any way, shape or form. Therefore, he was a spotless sacrifice. And because we couldn't get out of sin, because sin was in us, Jesus had set us free from sin. Wonderful. Romans 5, verse 18. Therefore, as through one man's offence, Adam, judgment come to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, Jesus, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by also one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Amen? So Adam took us into the pool of sin and Jesus died on the cross and because we've accepted Jesus, he took us out from the pool of sin. When you look at John the Baptist, he said, repent for the remission of your sin. When you look at Jesus and a lot of the New Testament states, it would believe and be baptised. They had to repent because they knew the law. The Jews knew the law. They knew that what they were doing wrong. The Gentile was in a different situation. They didn't have this Jewish law. That Jewish law didn't exist. You know? And so it was a different situation for the Jew and the Gentile, although both sinned. In accepting God's grace through Jesus' death and resurrection, we're transferred from Adam into Christ. Adam was uh, the first born to Christ. He's called the second Adam. And although we were born into Adam's family, we became adopted into God's family. So God took you and adopted you and made you his own. The minute you said, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe Jesus died and rose again. At that point, you were taken and you were made spiritually alive. You were dead, but your spirit came alive and you were placed into a new family, the family of God. Hallelujah. And you become an adopted son or an adopted daughter into a new family. So your spiritual heritage became different. You were cut off from the heritage of sin and now you've been sown into the heritage of righteousness. Amen? And we become righteous. We are the righteousness of God. 
John 3, verse 5. John 3, verse 5. Most assuredly, assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is flesh gives birth to flesh, but that that is born of the spirit gives life to spirit. Do not marvel at what I've said to you. You must be born again or born from above. Hallelujah. So we were all born of flesh and flesh gives birth to flesh. But we had to be born of the spirit. Why? Because God is spirit. Amen. And so we become, we were spiritually dead but suddenly when you got born again you became spiritually alive. See, Nicodemus didn't understand what he meant. He said, what? Can a man be born again? Must he re-enter his mother's womb? And his mother looked with tears in her eyes and thought, you know? But Jesus would say, no, you must be born again of the Spirit. You must become alive in your spiritual nature. At salvation, many things happen to you. These are just a few. There are over 30. You were justified and declared right with God on behalf of Jesus. That's what happened. You were made children of God. Instantaneously, you were made children of God. We gained access to God. We've got access. You watch some of the Marvel films and stuff like that, and you look at the gods that they represent and superpowers, and if you watch the one, the immortals, and da -da -da. guess what? A load of old Hogwash, sorry to ruin your film uh, fantasies. But you've got access to the God of gods and the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen? And you didn't have to go on some sort of secret mission to get it. You know, you watch these films and if they want access into something, they've got to work it all out and they've got to earn it and they've got to get this and they've got to find this special crystal and stick it in the rhino and then pull it back out and nail it to a tree and find this and do this and get in this decision and wait for the sun to hit that door and the water to drop at that point and yes, now I can we haven't got to do any of that isn't it wonderful? See, salvation is easy I think God looked at Adam and went he's not that bright we better make it easy this has got to be quite simple you know so we have access to God. We are reconciled to God. We receive forgiveness for our sin. Hallelujah. Isn't it wonderful to know that you're forgiven for your sin, for your shortcomings? We are placed in Christ in heavenly places. So God's moved you from this worldly, chaotic order and rules and said, no, where you belong is actually in my son. My son is in you by the Holy Spirit and you are going to be placed in my son as well and seated in heavenly places. That is your, uh, that is what you are, a citizen of heaven. Amen? They are the rules for you. Whatever country you live in, you live by their rules and traditions. You move to China, mate, you say some stuff, you'll get a slap and you'll be cooked up and offered out to the locals or whatever. You know, you've got to abide by their rules in a lot of countries. Okay, well, when we, we're, we're in the world, but we're not of it, you know. We belong to the kingdom of heaven and the rules by which we operate are different to the rules of the world. So when the world comes along and says, right, Ricky, X, Y and Z and that's your portion, that's your lot, you don't have to accept that because you're not governed by the rules of this world. We're made acceptable to God. I am acceptable. We are a fragrant offering to God. Isn't that wonderful? Don't you just love fragrant offerings when you're sitting on a train and the guy next to you stinks of B.O.? You know, or someone's got bad breath, you... You kind of want to give them a polo, but you know that's insulting them at the same time. But we're a fragrant offering, acceptable to God, heavenly citizens. We are members of the household of God. I'm not just his child, an only child. I've got a family. Us, together, effective life, church, his children. 
You could be more enthusiastic. You know, you really are. He's chilled us up together. Amen. Thank you, my sister. We are no longer slaves to sin. See, we were slaves. We were stuck in it. There was no way out. But Jesus has come along and said, wait, I'm the door. I'm the way out from the predicament of sin and you not being able to relate, have a relationship with the Father. But I'm the way out. I'm the door. If you come through me, you'll get to him. Wonderful. So you are no longer be a slave to sin. You've got a choice in the matter. If all these amazing things happen to us, and that is our, our place, why do we then still struggle with sin? Why do we still stumble in many ways? Why do we, because we live in a fallen world that is corrupt by sin, we are no longer slaves to sin, but we still experience temptation. And that temptation is presented to us in lots of different ways. We still encounter the fiery darts of the evil one. That's still happening. Which we're called to stand against by lifting up the shield of faith. We battle against the flesh and the desires of the flesh, which is the carnal thinking. The flesh. We, what is the flesh? It's the mind. It's the way the world operates. That's the flesh. And we give in to the flesh. And you get caught up with worldly things and you start doing them. But that's not your calling. That's not what you're about anymore. See, you've changed from being a child who doesn't know a child of sin to becoming a mature adult in the spirit. I've said this before. When you've got a child, they do stupid things and it's kind of cute, you know? But when they get older, it's not so cute. So if we go out for a meal and Caleb gets, he likes it, wagamamas, and he turns around and goes, here, Dad, watch this and gets his dinner and sticks it all over his head and then gets his drink and pours it over himself and goes... <laughs> yeah, my son's just had a mental breakdown. Do you want me to deliver him to you or are you going to come and get him? You'll say there's something wrong. That's not normal. Not for an adult. For a child, yeah. Not for an adult. We change. We leave childish things behind. We're sulking over every feeling and emotion and rejection and you know, we all maybe struggle with rejection at times but things that we begin to move away from the childish things of the flesh and we move deeper into the things of the spirit. If Christ has given us a new identity why are we still sinful? We know that those who are outside of Christ are dead in their trespasses, in their sins. But we have been born again to Jesus. Yet, is there sin still at my core? I've heard this said many times. People have wicked hearts. Christians have wicked hearts. I've got a wicked heart. I must overcome my heart. I must overcome my sinful nature. If indeed our sinful nature remains sinful and our hearts remain wicked, how then can we be sure that we've got peace with God and we're actually transformed? Because now I'm confused. Am I transformed or am I not transformed? What am I living by? Here is a short passage by an American pastor called Andrew Farley, quite interesting, and he says this. The idea that Christians have a sinful nature is popular in Christian teaching, but the Bible does not teach this. Before we believed in Christ, we were enslaved to sin and spiritually dead. But when we believed in the gospel of God, he gave us a new righteousness, a new heart, that was incorruptible and compatible with his nature. We believe we are no longer slaves of sin, but we become slaves of righteousness. Romans 6.18 
So where does the idea that Christians have a sinful nature or core come from? This is for Christians, not non-Christians. Where does the idea come from? Well, there's a Greek word called sark, S-A-R-X, which literally means flesh. That's what the word means, flesh. Yet in some translations of the Bible, including the NIV, it's been mistakenly translated in the term sinful nature. So they've replaced the original meaning of the word stark, which means flesh, and instead they've written it as sinful nature. Now the problem with this interpretation is it insinuates that Christians are sinful at their core when we're not. Because you've got a new core, you've got a new heart, you've got a new spirit, you are new in Christ Jesus, you are seated with him in heavenly places. Yes, you still sin, but you have a new heart. And you're not trapped in your sin or the consequence of sin because Jesus has paid the price. For this reason, the more literal translation is preferred, flesh. Believers battle against the flesh, which is a way of thinking and acting independently of Christ. So instead of thinking the way we should and acting according to Christ, we start acting independently of Christ and we start acting according to the flesh. However, we are no longer enslaved to that way of thinking but have been set free and become slaves of righteousness. Amen? The only slavery for the believer is to be a slave of righteousness, not a slave of sin. So in summary, believers do not have a sinful nature, yet we experience the pull of the flesh, the worldly thinking, the flesh, a way to think, our mind set on things of the flesh walking according to the flesh. But the flesh is not our nature, it is not us. We are new-hearted children of God who actually oppose the flesh. I don't want to be fleshly. I want to be spiritual and whatever God wants me to be. Amen? Our flesh is not our opponent in that sense or ourselves. We are not our own opponent. We haven't got to beat ourselves up continually. Our battle is against sin and powers and principalities. That's the battle. Warring against, where's the battlefield? The mind, the flesh, the thinking, not the heart. I've got a pure heart. I've got a God heart. He's given me a new heart and he said he's going to live within me. Well, if I haven't got a new heart, Jesus isn't going to live with my old sinful nature. He's pure. He can't live with it. The light and the dark don't dwell together. He said, you've got a pure heart. And because of that, I'm empowered by Christ. So I don't battle against myself. Ezekiel 36, verse 26 says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. Hallelujah. The ancient word for heart is the center or core of our being. The catalyst, the stone uh, is, is the stony heart is removed and now we have a flexible heart that God can work with that is willing to submit and move into compliance with the Holy Spirit. See, so a non-Christian has not got a new heart. They can't comply with the things of the Spirit. Why? Because they're not born again. They haven't got a spiritual birth. So they can't. Amen? This is what happens at salvation. We were crucified with Christ in order that we, we may be dead to sin but alive to God. A part of that process meant we underwent a heart transplant. We received a new heart, a responsive heart to God. 
We also receive the gift of the Holy Spirit who is the seal of our salvation and helps guide us to being conformed to the image of Christ. That is our goal. We are on a journey of being conformed to the image of Christ Jesus in word, deed and action. That's who we're going to be like. Amen? So we should, we should uh, do you know when you go to a hospital and people had a baby, immediately everyone wants to say who the baby looks like. Oh, it's got so and so this. Oh, it's got your chin. Oh, it's got your shoulder. Oh, it's got, oh, great granddad Bevin. It's got his nose. You know, and we've got to immediately, as soon as the child's born, we're labelling it with all the different things as to who it represents. But when you become born again, you should begin to look like Jesus. You look like Jesus. How do we look like Jesus? Not physically, we look like Jesus in our heart. And our heart becomes our action. And our heart takes over our way of thinking. And our mind becomes renewed. Why? Because we've got a new heart. Never said you've got to renew your heart. Said you've got to renew your mind. Because it's the mind is where the flesh gets the victory. Sin conquers in that place. Now we know God has made us new creations at salvation. We're better equipped to understand who we war against. So many Christians are just warring against themselves. They're just warring and battling continually against themselves. That's where their battle is. Uh, and they don't get victory because you're fighting the wrong battle. They're fighting a battle you haven't got to fight. Amen? I haven't got to overcome sin. Sin has been defeated at the cross. Hallelujah. It's not my job to overcome Satan. Satan's been defeated. Hallelujah. My job is to walk in the victory. Now, I can either walk in the victory of Christ or I can step out of it and walk according to the flesh. But I've got to walk in the victory that Christ has given me. I can either walk according to the, what the Word of God says I am. I'm above and not beneath. I'm the head and not the tail. I'm the this and I'm not that and so on and so forth. Or I can live according to the flesh, which is the mind, which says, no, you're the son of a rapist. No, you can't read very well. No, you're this. No, you're that. No, you're not very bright. No, you're... So and I can live according to the flesh. Or I can live according to the Spirit, which is in line with God. And that says something totally different about me. So you've got to know who you are and who you're fighting and what you're fighting. I'm not trying to fight the old sin nature. The old sin nature's been done away with. He nailed it to the cross. What, we all take it back off again? So you're not nailing that to the cross, not my sin, buddy. I'll have that, thank you very much. He nailed it to the cross and he triumphed over it. Amen? And he forgave you for it. See, every sin you will ever commit, Jesus paid the price for at the cross. All your sins past, all your sins present, and all your sins future have been paid for in full. Not a Dwight debit. Every time you sin, Jesus nails himself back on the cross again to pay for you. It's been done. He looks at the Father and said, done. Paid for. And Father says, that's right. And Satan goes, Pam, I'll try another one. Satan is the accuser of the brethren. Why are you accusing yourself? Satan's the accuser. No, we've got to know who we are and the elements of which we fight. Knowing that God has made us in, uh, new creations at salvation, we're better equipped to understand how we war against sin and how we conquer it, as well as walking according to the Spirit. Paul makes it clear how these things are in opposition to each other. Galatians 5, 16. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, he doesn't say you, the lust of you. He says the lust of the flesh, as if it's an outside entity to you. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And they are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. 
But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Amen? And the law, sin, gratifies the law. As in the law is good, but it highlights sin. And sin must be paid for. And the wages of sin are death. That's the wages of sin. Death. To Adam and Eve, you will now die. Because you've earned the wages of your sin, and the wages of your sin is death. That's what they deserve. So when you go to work in the week, and you work for your employer at the end of the week, on duty, you expect to be paid. Why? Because what you've done in the week, you deserve your wages. Amen? We also see that the flesh can also be a way of giving us an identity sometimes, of trying to be perfect outside of Christ. Galatians 3.3 3 says, Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, you are now being made perfect by the flesh? You know, that the church in Galatia, they'd got born again and they got saved and they understood the spiritual dynamic, but suddenly their behaviour became what was important and they became proud of their great behaviour. And suddenly we think uh, we're, we're actually okay because of the good that we're doing. And we think, well, we're okay because I'm a good person. My nan always said that, well, I'm a good person, never murdered anyone. You know, that was always their answer. I'm a good person, never murdered anyone. We identify ourselves sometimes by the things that we do instead of the heart. Oh, but I serve in church, so I'll be all right. I go to church sometimes, so I'll be all right. That justifies me in my relationship. I will do this and I do that and I help there, so that justifies me. And we begin to justify ourselves through works. And we are not justified through works. The works are the fruit. That's the fruit of a transformed life. Because I'm transformed, I like people. Some of them. No, I like people. I've been transformed. Because I've been transformed in my, my heart, I've, I can trust people. They might let me down, but I can still trust. Amen? Genesis 4, verse 6. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do so well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. So Adam and Eve have had two children, Cain and Abel, and they've made their offerings, one offering's greater than the other, and it's a heart condition, situation, and Cain is feeling down and he's angry and he's frustrated. And, and God looks at him and says, why is your countenance fallen? It's very hard to be right with God and miserable at the same time. It's not easy. If you're miserable, it's because you're not right with God. And you'll say, no, God's all right. It's just, it's just my neighbour or somebody else. But love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, and love your brother as yourself. So that's no longer our excuse. If you do well, or do not do well, sin lies at the door. And that is to lie down and pounce like a lion or a tiger. They lay in the grass and they wait for the prey to come along. Satan prowls around like a lion, seeking whom he can devour. So sin comes into your head, your way of thinking, and, and it lays there waiting to trip you up, waiting for an opportunity to say, pick me. Take revenge. Don't do that. Do this. Cheat on the form. It's only a little one. You deserve DLA anyway. Do this. Don't worry about the parking ticket. Oppose it anyway. You might get your money off. Yes, you broke the law and you should pay it, but don't everyone try and sin crouches at the door, and its desire is to have you. And sometimes 
our children or our family do things that are opposed to God and we think, oh, we'll just let them off. God knows and he loves them. You know, and I've got to show love. Yes, God knows and God loves them. You've got to show love to them, but that does not mean you agree with them. You don't agree with them. What example are you if you never say to your kids, kids, this is wrong. Jesus died and rose again for you and he ever liveth to make intercession and he loves you. And I love you enough to tell you that behavior's not right. I know you're 32, but... But, well, we don't want to upset them. Because you've got to remember, children are like gremlins. You upset them and they turn into little nasties. And you've got to put up for it all week. You know? They're going to make you pay. But you'll either be counted in the flesh or counted in the spirit. And we've got to love each other enough to be counted in the spirit and say, do you know what? It's only a minor thing, but it's not quite right. Just want to let you know. Paul, that's not condemnation. It's helping each other step over that positive parasite called sin. But that parasite called sin is not you. You are not sin. You've been regenerated. You've been washed clean by the most powerful substance in the world. What? The blood of Jesus has cleansed you and he's broken the chains of sin. But sin is still there in your life, in the mind. And its desire is to have you. That's what sin's desire is, to have you. Why? Because it doesn't want God to have us. It's a powerful thing to warn each other. And scripture says we should warn each other. Sin is crouching at the door. Sometimes it's leaning on the doorbell. Other times it's just jumping straight in through the window. Sometimes we, we fight and we say, get off, get off, get off, you're not coming in to my life. No, other times we say, come on in, baby, I'll crack open a beer. What are we doing? And we welcome sin in like a familiar friend. Oh, I haven't seen you for a while. Let me put, a, put an extra burger on the barbie for you. Come on in. But you know what? The believer always struggles because it's not right. It's not a part of who they are. This is a foreign body. It no longer feels comfortable to you. When I was unregenerated, sin felt fantastic. I'm not going to lie. I didn't have much problem with sin. Getting extra money, working, signing on. I was doing the whole work. Brilliant. At one, no, that's the wrong word. Uh, at one point, I was working, I was signing on the dole, okay? I was working for a builder, okay? And we were repointing with cement the job centre, the whole building, round the back, and redoing the roof on Harmer Street. Oh, it's half past 12, I'm going to sign on. I'd run downstairs, got work jeans, things to cut on there, sit there, hello, Mr. Gessler, have you done any work the last two weeks? No, sir, excellent. Da -da -da. Cheers, mate, there you go. Back out, back to point in the job centre. I didn't have no problem with sin. Sin was fantastic. Sin, 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 Ugh. You know? We gratified the flesh. We loved the flesh. But when you get born again, it loses its sweetness. It don't taste the same anymore. It's like diet, any diet drink to me leaves an awful aftertaste in your mouth. It's like, I just can't do diet drinks. I'm going to balloon. It's just the way I am. But sin is not part of you. Romans 7 verse 15. And I love this, what Paul says, for I am doing, i sorry, for what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But I hate that that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law, that the law is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Now you end up agreeing with the sin. It's saying, look, I don't do this. I don't want to be like that. But that wretched parasite, 
lives in me and it's in my mind and temptations come up and I go, yeah, all right, then I'll do that. And then afterward, why should I do that? I don't want to do that. Beat myself up over it. Lord, forgive me. Go out the other door and that parasite's there again. <sighs> you know? And he said, why do I do I don't want to do this. For I know that in me, that is my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will his presence with me, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. For the good that I will do, I will to do, I do not do, but evil I will not to do, that I practice. So he's saying as much as I'm trying to do good, I end up doing bad. I don't do the good I want to do, and the bad I don't want to do, I'm a flipping expert. I keep doing it all the time, and Paul said in another passage, I am the chief of sinners. The chief. There's no one greater than me at sinning. I'm an expert at it. And he's frustrated, but he never condemned himself. Hallelujah. Why? Because he knew he was fighting. So if you condemn yourself, you're just beating yourself up. You're like a schizophrenic person just trying to inflict pain upon yourself. You can't accept yourself. How can anybody else accept you? Because you're a dirty, rotten sinner and you're evil at your core. And yes, God's forgiven you, but you're still evil. No, you're not evil. The parasite is evil. You've been set free. You've been washed by the blood. Yes, you still do things that are evil, but you, that is not who you are. It's not your core anymore. You've changed. This means that we have a choice in situations in our lives. We either surrender to the power of sin, or we recognize that that is not our portion, and we walk according to the Spirit. This is why many Christians struggle with self-condemnation. Because I abuse someone, I'm an abuser. And that will always be who I am because of what I did. Because I hit my wife once, I'm a wife beater. And that will be who I am because that's what I did. And we live in self-condemnation for the rest of our lives, never really being set free to be who God has called us to be. Free, liberated. The old has gone, the new has come. It's fantastic. That old man, Adam, has died and I've been birthed in Jesus. And Jesus is my identity. Yes, I can be a miserable git. That's the flesh. That's sin. I can be impatient. That's the flesh. That's sin. But me as an actual person, when I'm not sulking, I'm a nice guy. There's good within me. I've got a good heart. Often husband and wife, when they go through stuff on one side or the other, and it tends to be the wife, they tend to turn around to say to people, oh, but he's got a good heart, really. He don't really mean it. See, if you knew him like I knew him, he's got a good heart. It's just like buried in there. But he's, actually, he's all right. He's got a good heart. And that is actually reality. But it's sin lurking at the door. And that parasite desires, you've got to start fighting that parasite of sin. Stop fighting yourself. Start, fight, start fighting sin. I'm going to be the mother God has ordained for me to be. I'm not going to keep giving in to this wretched parasite called sin that keeps tripping me up at every opportunity. And then making me think that I'm rubbish at everything. I refuse. I'm going to fight. I haven't got to fight me. I've got to fight that. It's external. Because my heart is for my lovely little brat, devil children. No, my heart is for my wonderful blessings in my life called children. Romans 8, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, now, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ. We do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit is life in Jesus Christ. And he has made us free from the law of sin and death. Amen? We've been set free. Sin is like a parasite. A parasite 
gets on you like a tick. And it gets on your flea. And it gets on you or your dog, cat. And then what it does, it lives there. The dog isn't a flea or a tick. The parasite is. And it lives on you. And then it begins to drain you. It lives off of the animal. And that's how it survives. It's a freeloader. Sin is a freeloader. And it wants to drain you. When we were in Brazil a few years ago, Mara got a tick. And she was ticked off. No, she got a tick. She had a thing on her foot. And she says to me in the middle of the night, I've got a scab on my ankle. I'm sure it's getting bigger. The middle of light, the night, love. We're in Brazil, it's dark. We're in a strange house. We'll have a look at it. You have a look. We'll look in the morning. Yeah, but it itchy. It. Oh, for crying out loud. Turn the light on. Do some repentance. Uh, I look at it. Oh, that's a tick. Oh, oh, what's the tick? What's the tick? So then she's straight on Google. In the middle of Brazil, by the Bolivian border, you can still get Google. You can't get water, food, or toilet roll, but you can get Google. And she's there straight away, Google, Googling it all up. The next day, she's at the hospital, having to have it removed. And they've got to remove it the right way. Because if you just pull it, the head breaks off and stays there. And it grows a new body. So the only way you can do it, you've got to manoeuvre it carefully and you've got to twist it. Or what my mum used to do, poor cat, never forget her, if our cat got a tick, my mum I used to smoke, she'd say, Matthew, give me your fag. I'd give her my cigarette and she'd burn the edge of the tick. Our cat was walking around like it's an ashtray, like a rock-hard cat, tattooed, spots all over it. <laughs> Don't bring your rock wild and grand our ass, mate, oh, I'll have you. But... You've got to remove it properly. Now, we didn't condemn the dog or the cat. I didn't condemn Marla to oblivion, because that's a parasite. That's a tick. And it's sucking your blood. And it longs to have you. You know? You need to go to doctors and they remove it. And then, after they've removed it, for about six months or a year, she kept saying, do you think that they got all of it out? Because I've been reading up and you can get all sorts of illnesses. Of course they, yeah, but she did it so quick. Uh, so in the end, I turned around and said, no, they didn't get all of it out. You've got all those diseases. You'll probably die in two weeks. Now can we get on? And then she goes, oh, don't say that. That's not right. Well, what do you want me to do? You won't accept the truth. But it's a parasite. We've got to learn who we're fighting. Stop beating ourselves up. Stop living in guilt. Letting our sin determine our personality. Sin determine our identity. That tick didn't determine Mara's identity. Her identity was determined in Christ Jesus. The sin got the uh, tick got in the way. And with sin, sometimes we struggle with familiar sin. And that old familiar tick comes in and it, and it's hooked on. And sometimes, because you're human and lazy, it'll be all right, it'll come off later. It'll be all right. Roger's got one of them anyway, I've seen it. So, you know, what does it matter if I've got one? You know? And we justify the, the presence of the, the sin living there. Or, well, at least my tick's not quite as big as Emma's tick. <laughs> you should see that tick. It is humongous. <laughs> Honestly, when Carl can't go weightlifting down the gym, he just says, Emma, let me use your tick. <laughs> and he just powers it out. I mean, that's a tick and a half with attitude. You know? Sometimes we dress the tick up. We say, well, it's not really a tick. It's not really, it's a flea. It's not really a tick. It's still a parasite. It doesn't belong on you. It's not a part of you, and you've got dominion over it, and you've been set free. Amen? See, when they get sheep, they put them through the sheep dip, and the sheep dip is there to get all the parasites off of them. I hate parasites, because it's so uncomfortable for the animal. My dog, you see, Half an hour, 
got. Then he goes after, and then he might have gone, oh, 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 but that's not who we're called to be. And we beat ourselves up. And sometimes we have an attitude of, will I ever conquer this? It's so tight. Yeah, but the problem is you're beating yourself up because you think you're rotten at the core. What a wretched man I am. No, what a wonderful born-again believer that you are who will spend eternity with Christ Jesus. And you are the apple of his eye, even though you were dead in your sin. And he still loved you. Wow. That's incredible. That's wonderful. And that's why scripture says, guess what? Sin will no longer have dominion over you. Not you will no longer have dominion over you, because you've got to conquer you. You haven't got to conquer you. Conquer the parasite that we inherited through Adam, that we now have authority over because we're set free. Start fighting in the right places. Start getting healing mentally, emotionally, what we need. You are not the sum total of your actions. I used to say to my kids when they were naughty, you're a naughty boy. Mother used to pull me up and say, no, he's not a naughty boy, he does naughty things. I'm going, I'm a typical dad, I'm going, Splitting hairs, love. Splitting hairs. Come on. And she said, no, you're not going to say he's a naughty boy. He's not a naughty boy. He does naughty things. Can you imagine standing in front of the judge? Well, no, you see, I'm not really a wobber. I just like to take things. It's a bit of an accident, really, but I'm not kind of a wobber. No, I'm not a murderer. I just like to strangle the life out of people. But me, myself, not actually a murderer. Yeah, right, splitting hairs. Shall we pray? Father, in Jesus' name, we just ask you, Father, for revelation over your word, that we would live and thrive and have our being in Christ Jesus. That we don't, yes, we ask forgiveness for our sin, and we choose to sin, and we need to ask you for forgiveness. And I thank you, Lord, that you've set us free and you have forgiven us. But I thank you that our sin is not us, it's not our core because you've given us life and life abundant. And I thank you for it, Lord. I thank you, Jesus, that you died on the cross for each one of us and rose again so that we can be free. Not only do we not face the punishment of sin, but we have eternal life to live eternally. We have no fear of death because the sting of death has been removed. The infusion of sin has been neutralized through the blood of Jesus. And I thank you for it, Lord. I pray, Father, you would teach us to war, just like David said, Lord, you ready my hands for war. May we be spiritually equipped to battle properly. For years, the church has battled, fighting the wrong battles and not understanding Lord, give us understanding so that we may have the victory. In Jesus' name. Father, I pray over each one of us this week that we would go, that we would walk in what you had for us, that we would prosper just as our soul prospers. Lord, that we would be in health, Lord. Father, I pray against sickness and disease over this congregation. People who are sick and ill and diseased and stuff like that. And we might say, well, it's that time of life. You know, what do you expect? No, we're of a different portion. Moses' eyes didn't dim. We don't have to be like that, Lord. Or give us the grace in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for the wonder of who you are. And we thank you for your word this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to close with a, a worship song. If you want prayer for something personally, for yourselves, individually, then just come forward. We'll pray with you and for you in Jesus' name. Amen.